John of the Wine here, and we're continuing our ramble around the vineyards of England. And I'm, of course, joined yet again by my good friend Oz Clark, author of the English Wine Book, which is an absolute must for your stockings. And I'm also joined by Kieran Atkinson from the English Wine Project, who again will be giving us some great foresights into uh, the way wine is made and so on. And we're going now to East Sussex, to Ditchling Common, to the Ridgeview Vineyard. And we'll shortly be joined by Simon Roberts, son of the original owner, who will tell us all about his three fabulous wines. But before that, we're going to try them. Now, the first wine we're going to try is the Ridgeview Bloomsbury. If you can see that label. Okay. So let's have a little taste of this. And this is really their original wine, I think, Charlie. This is this is the one they, to me, that I first uh, became aware of, Bloomsbury. They named their wines after different areas of London, Fitzrovia, Cavendish, Bloomsbury, yeah. Grosvenor, God knows what. But Bloomsbury is the one that's really stuck. And I think this is probably um, their volume leader. This is their non-vintage blend, although I think at one time it was vintage. Um, they, they, they spent quite a few years making uh, their basic wine as a vintage. Everybody did in, in the English uh, wine business. If you're going to make non-vintage, you've got to build up reserve stocks. And I don't think that they were able to build up reserve stocks until, you know, this decade. So uh, what, do we, what grapes do we have in here then? This will be Chardonnay, uh, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. And yep. interestingly enough, um, the, the dominant chunk of this is Chardonnay. And it comes from a vineyard that they've gone into a partnership with down near Chichester. Uh, so that's quite a few miles away. It's still in Sussex. And it's a fascinating vineyard because it's called Tinwood. Um, and it's, and it's, it's, it's just a flat piece of land. I, I've known it for years because I used to be an actor at Chichester. It's, it's next to a very good pub called the Anglesey Arms. And it, it was flat and it was basically salad land because the Tucker family who make it were one of the biggest suppliers of salads to supermarkets. Obviously, they decided the stress, the high stress and low profit margin was more than they could cope with. And they said, we want to actually, they, we, we're thinking of trying to develop um, this land as vineyard land. Got hold of Mike Roberts, the 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 uh, the the um the founder of Ridgeview said, "Are you interested?" And Mike said, "Basically, of course I'm interested, but I can't afford that. You'll have to come into some sort of partnership." So actually, the Tucker family have taken they have uh, their part investors actually in 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 Ridgeview. But the thing about it is, it doesn't look very promising. It just looks rather heavy and and flat and dark. But there's lots and lots of flint on the surface, and that's a precursor for chalk. And if you just go down just a little way, this Tinwood Vineyard, which is a massive, great vineyard, it's absolutely solid chalk, and it's flat as a pancake. This is most unusual, and it makes a very particular sort of wine. And I think it's added a that's, tremendous... That's, that's a picture of the, uh, the Ridgeview, Ridgeview Vineyard. Ah, that's the Ridgeview so, one, Charlie. Absolutely. That's, that's the home that's vineyard. Fun, yeah. Oh, oh, so how do you think it's changed the wine? How do you think it's changed the wine now they've, they've got it's this? It's made it much more citrus. I think that the Tinwood, the Tinwood Chardonnay um, is doing what Chardonnay often does in Champagne, um, which gives a very citrus, clear, bright quality. Um, some Chardonnays from Champagne and England make a much rounder, fuller, honeyed flavour, but uh, the typical Chardonnay from, say, the Côte de Blanc would be, would, be, would be very bright, very limpid, very uh, citrus, lemon zest and lemon flower, a little bit of creaminess, but a cool, reserved kind of creaminess. And I think this is what they're aiming for here. And one thing I particularly get, I get a saline quality. Do you get a saline quality? Yeah, definitely. And, and also, Ozzy, it's only 12% ABV, so it's quite, quite a light wine, isn't it? In terms of alcoholic in the sparkling zone, Charlie. Yeah, most are in that. Most are in that zone. As a as a as a maker, you're aiming for for around twelve for sparkling because you don't you don't want those hot heats coming off the the yeah. big alcohol wines. I mean, for me, I I actually perhaps you uh, planted the the thought in my head, Oz, but I, I start to get that that light lemon coming through. Maybe I don't know about brew. I might be I might be extending it, but certainly like a lemon, honeyed lemon. I think it's uh, 
lemon curd. A nice yeah. good. Yep. garbage of lemon curd. <laughs> Uh, I, 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 you can't you can't plant that seed in my mind. I, I'm, I'm, going, I'm going light. <laughs> I'm going light lemon. Maybe mm. it is, but it is. But it's interesting. The lemon thing is is important because it, it genuinely is citrus. And then you you want to say, well, okay, what citrus? And this time it's not grapefruit and it's not orange. It is lemon, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. But it is. But it is a light lemon with a little bit of perfume on top. It's not an aggressive lemon at all. It's not sort of lemon pith. No. I think I think lem lemons lemons a funny term in that I think when most people think of lemon, there's a there's a great drink in the military called Screech, and uh, it makes you go Screech, and it's a lemon drink and it's not very nice. But this is not like that at all. This is this is very soft, very light. I think this is absolutely you know if, if I know I know from reading your book Oz uh, that Mike travelled the world uh, when when these wines were were produced. Mike Roberts, the 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 yeah. once owner. And I can see why, because I think it's a, it's, 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 it's fantastic. It's a great flag bearer for, for English, non-vintage sparkling wine. I think it's excellent. The very okay. first one he made, very first one he made was in 2000, uh, 1996, uh, which was from bought-in fruit. Actually, it was from Kentish fruit, although, you know, as a nice Sussex boy, Simon Roberts would say, oh, please, do we have to mention that? Um, but he, it won, um, the, it won some award for the U United Kingdom Vineyard Association Best Wine of the Year or something. The yep. first vintage uh, at four years old in 2000. And, and Mike took that first wine he ever made to Australia to show to the International Cool Climate um, Conference what the potential was in England. And you think that in 2000, there was like, there was Night Timber and there was Ridgeview Mm -hmm. of the new the new wave and one or two other people just nibbling at the edges but basically it was just two and now we look at in 2020 20 years later the amazing vibrancy of the of the um of the of the english and welsh wine industry and honestly uh, one has to say well mike you were a visionary uh, and also you were brave mm. think how brave it is to take an english wine a spark wine, to australia and, and and face up to the face up to the to the to the Aussies and saying I'm a pom and here's my English wine and you can imagine the ribald abuse he managed to get when he stood up and did that but it's worked. I think. Okay, I think guys, I, well, let's now try the Ridgeway, Ridgeview, Blanc, de Blanc. Now, it's one here we are, Ridgeview Blanc de Blanc. Yep. yep. Nice, nice smart label, I think that. Yes, that very, very smart. Black, black, gold and silver. Now, this is an, uh, an unusual wine for Ridgeview because Ridgeview um, do a lot of contract uh, grape growing. They, they actually go into relationships with growers. They don't just casually go onto the market and say, anyone got 10 tons of grapes. They go into proper contractual agreements with growers and indeed develop vineyards around the country but this one is from their home vineyard and charlie if you want to hold up that that picture of the, in the book again this is the vineyard just underneath the south downs that mike roberts saw and he and he and he, and he if there we are, there we are. Up, a little bit down further down show it so you can see the rear, it's a bit further down charlie so you can see the south downs there's the south downs just there and that's the view the ridge view that Mike Roberts saw because he used to go to Champagne every year with his computer um, people. He used to run a computer company. He always used to go to the, the Royal Champagne Hotel. I don't know if you know, but it's, it's, it has got the best view in Champagne. Looking down towards Epinay and the Marne Valley, it is just heavenly. Always a man for a view. And this is the wine from the Vignon with a view. 16 or 17 acres just out the back there. And, and the, all the Chardonnay for this comes from that vineyard. I think I think that's uh, it's a really nice wine. I think I think what I found interesting so far about about the tastings is how is how clean the wines are, and I mean that from a perspective of autolysis. And uh, I don't get lots of secondary flavours yet. I'm not I'm not kind of getting necessarily creaminess or butteriness. I'm I'm getting still getting those fresh citrus fruits, which are, which are very 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 nice. But I, I, I'm getting Clean flavors. So it'd be interesting to talk to Simon about. Yeah. Does he want those secondary flavors? Yeah, of course. We are. We're talking two things here. Firstly, the 2015 vintage, um, which is was a pretty cold vintage, from what I remember. 
um, so that the wines have taken a while to come round. And I think therefore um, Chardonnay uh, from this, this vineyard under the lee of the South Downs but in a cool year like 2015, five years old is not very old. I think it's also showing in 2015 a tremendous citrus clarity to it. Just what you were saying, uh, Kieran. I also, I like a bit more extra going on. Mm. I, like, I like to start seeing the brioche and the croissants and the mm. hazelnuts. I love that. I think we will get those, um, mm. but we haven't got them, them yet. But I, I'm, I'm getting this saline thing again. Yes. Now, I, I've tasted, I've, I've got this saline before in, in Ridgeview Wines. Might be worth uh, asking Simon, is it, a, is it a vineyard thing? After all, Tinwood's close to the sea. Uh, this one's just over the hill from the, the English Channel. I wonder with the vintage wines that we've had and the non-vintage wines, like I get a, I get a, way more fresher taste so far with with the vintage me too as opposed to the non-vintage it's, it's cleaner cleaner fruit and so i still get that lemon there is still that citrus going on maybe not a lemon curd oh, uh, i'm but, getting lemon curd don't worry i'll get it for you are you get it I'm, I'm thinking more lemon meringue but uh, uh lemon meringue pie a la what the kind one my mum and probably your yes, mum yeah 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 you're right lemon meringue pie yeah, according yeah. to my mum's recipe and, it, it's better, and I think you know it's worth it's is you know so is it worth the extra money to go from non vintage to vintage? And this was a great discussion in the Light Goons officers' mess. And obviously, of course, it is at all times, even when you've got no money at any time in the month. Uh, but I think you do get a purity of flavour. You do, you do, you do get, and, and I really like the vintage angle. I think it's, I think it's, yeah. and. and quite a few of the English winemakers have not gone down non-vintage because they have said we're in a marginal climate. Uh, the vintage is of paramount importance mm. in creating the thrill of the wine, in creating the, 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 the beauty, in, in creating the personality which makes it unlike any other. And I think it's a, it's a, it's a valid point and I hope English winemakers will go on discussing it for years, some making their non-vintage, some making their vintage. What, what so do you think? We're going to move on now to the 2014 Blanc de Noir. Again, I think a very attractive label. So it's Blanc de Noir. This is the third of our three wines we're tasting today. Oh, yes, fantastic mousse. Now, this one is 68% Pinot Noir and 32% Pinot Meunier. Uh, and this one is not estate fruit, but it, 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 I think I'm right in saying that uh, Mike Roberts really liked the wines made from the black grapes. Um, and I've often found that I, I'm, my favorite Ridgeview wines are the wines made from the black grapes. This is completely different in style, I think. Part of that must be the 2014 vintage because before 2018 came along, everyone was saying 2014 is the perfect vintage in England. Um, it's ripe and it's round and they had 6.3 million bottles and they thought that was tremendous. <laughs> Nowadays, of course, 6.3 million bottles uh, looks like nothing. But only six years ago, it was the biggest vintage we'd ever had. But, but also, but using the black grapes, it doesn't seem to have the sort of slightly pinkish colour that uh, other... Blanc well, Noir that we've tried. I thought it did, Charlie. So let me let's have a look. Well, funnily enough, I, it doesn't particularly. But no, when no, I looked I at it, uh, under different lights in my tasting area, I thought it did have. But yeah, it's, got, it, it's certainly got the fullest colour of them. Yeah, it, it, it does a little bit. And if you if you watch it as it pours, you watch it as it pours and watch it go into the glass. You can see it. You can see the. You can see kind of pink flashes almost. Yeah, I quite like that. Do you like it, Kieran? I, I, I actually prefer, I actually like uh, it. That, that is lovely. That's lovely. That's do, lovely. Do you, do, you, do, you, do you like to see the pink flashes or do you like to see the straw? Oh, 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 I, I, I like the pink flashes, definitely. I, I, I do like straw. I, when it's too clear, I find it a little bit concerning with, with uh, Blanc de... Blanc, blanc de Blanc. I, I, I do like a little bit of colour, otherwise I feel like um, it's maybe not had enough time or 
And I start to kind of wonder whether not some Sabal's creeped in there, but that might just be me as a as a wine well, person. I, I think with one of the things with uh, Ridgeview, I know this one has, you know, it's had six years, but one of the things with Ridgeview, they they have uh, made a, um, a practice of releasing their wines quite young. Mm. Often we're only 18 months uh, or so on the on on the cork. Uh, and of course, Mike Roberts was very candid with me uh, when I asked him about this. And he, he said, a cash flow, old boy. He yeah. said, you know, I'm, I mean, I mean, it's all my own money in this. Um, uh, and uh, I need the cash flow says I need to have that. Let's say the 2010 wine ready for Christmas 2012. Yeah. Um, and that's probably something worth asking Simon about things like malolactic fermentation and 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 uh, levels of dosage and things to see if he's saying I need to get most of my wine ready um, at only two years old. Uh, I thought the Bloomsbury, for instance, Kieran was extremely pale. I liked it, yes, but it was extremely I, pale. I, I I really liked the Bloomsbury. I thought it was a I thought it was a very simple wine. I mean that in the nicest possible way, in that it's exceptionally well made there is there is no i'm not that one tastes wine and go where's the fault but it's it's a well-made wine there is no fault and what i really liked about it which i'll be interested at your view was is the level of dosage so all of these wines again they are all very approachable none of them none of them are are sweet None of them are, are so serious that you're tasting them and you're like, uh, almost emperor's new clothes. I don't want to say anything, but is anyone else enjoying this? I could, I could, you know, I know this is, you know, we, we, we're recording this in the afternoon, but these wines, I think, are, are lovely aperitif wines. Yeah. Um, yeah, but are they, are they serious? And what, what do you think about dosage? Well, you see, I, I reckon the dosage on these would be eight grams. Be seven, eight, nine, seven eight nine which i i must admit i think is the sort of the, the the sweet spot for most dosage i'm i'm not a great fan of trying to force your dosage use down and down and down but i think by the time you get up to sort of 12 or 13 grams on the whole you can you can feel it a bit a bit more than you want now with the 14 i wonder is the dosage a gram or so higher or is it merely that the the year is a riper year mm. I, th I okay, think, guys. I, I think we need to keep keep the uh, keep the game moving along. Um, should we now introduce Simon? Oh, I'll bring him in. Hopefully. Oh, be here he comes. Hi, Simon. Hi, Hi Simon. So, uh, welcome, Simon. Thank you. Wish you Vineyards, Simon Roberts. We're delighted to have you here on the uh, Forever Thirsty blog. <laughs> so we're joined, of course, by our old friend Oz Clark and, of course, Kieran Atkinson from the English Wine Project. Now, we've tried and enjoyed all three of your lovely wines that you've sent us. So, um, Oz, <laughs> over to you, my friend. What well, one of the things, Simon. Well, welcome, by the way. Lovely to see you. And I hope that you, you. Uh, are sitting there at the moment, taking a, a brief moment off from a highly successful 2020. Tell us how 2020 went. Um, it's been really, it's been obviously really challenging, as it has been for everybody. Um, but there's been lots of positives out of it. I mean, before lockdown, our main focus was with the on-trade. That quickly stopped in March. So with that made us refocus our sales strategy, um, which has been really positive. So not that it was starting at a very high point, but online sales increased by over a thousand percent in a month. And um, so that was really good. And then at the end of lockdown, we set up our wine garden for a safe environment for people to come and do tastings and have something to eat. So that was really good. Um, and do you, think, that, really do you think that'll stay, Simon? Do you think that business will stay now? Yeah, for sure. So we've, we're looking at creating a sort of um, all year round um, development in the wine garden so we can offer something throughout the year. Um, and you can't beat that direct consumer contact, really. Um, it's been invaluable. You know, we get feedback from them. We get to see the people that want to drink our wines. So it's been really, really good. And then the great weather we had all summer meant that we had a really good harvest. So it was a little bit intense trying to keep everybody safe and 
everybody was ready to be picking at the same time. So we tried to fit six weeks, six weeks worth of harvest into about four weeks. But um, no, it's good. So it's been, it's been, as I say, challenging 2020, but there's been some positives for sure. So you're happy with the, the stuff you've got in the vats now? Does that, does that mean we're looking at three good to excellent vintages in a row for England? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's this year in particular, um, we saw, and I'm sure everyone that you speak to, they've, um, this year we, the fruit, lots and lots of small berries and lots of small bunches. So the, each berry is like a flavor explosion. Um, so especially the Pinot Mernier this year is just super intense, really complex. So um, hopefully I'll be allowed to shout very loudly about the Mernier this year. Well, we tasted your Bloomsbury and I've, I've known Bloomsbury for, for donkey's years. And by the way, uh, congratulations, 25 years virtually today, you, uh, your dear uh, much loved dad, Mike, founded Ridgeview. Is that right? Yeah. 25 years. So well done, 25 years of leading the way uh, in, in English wine making. English sparkling wine making. I, I say that advisedly because um, I one of the questions that I'm sure people ask you is, are you going to make still wines? Are you going to make Charmat wines? Are you going to make carbonated wines? Um, and I know that Mike's view was we have only, we've got one objective to make the best quality traditional method sparkling wines from the traditional grapes using the traditional equipment uh, but that was in 1995 1996 here we are 24 24 years later are you still of the same opinion yeah definitely um i mean that objective i don't think will change for a long time i mean it's you know we want to specialize in making one style of wine which is classic method english sparkling wine and do it to best of our ability and hopefully that means consistently and that's the key word consistently producing international quality sparkling wine um you know it's always been a conscious decision of the family that we would never we don't want to dilute the brands so it's not despite being asked numerous times we won't deal still wine we won't make beer you know so it's we're not going to go into gin or vermouth and oh, um, i wonder who you're talking about simon <laughs> No one at all. No, I mean, we have a really good friend of ours. I don't know if you've ever been Oz, um, the bull in Ditchling. And um, a long time ago, Dominic, the owner, asked Dad and I if we'd be interested in making a, a beer for them. And we literally leapt at the chance. So this is an amazing idea. And Tam, my sister and Marty, my wife, were like, there's no way you're doing that. Um, it would just take away your focus from what we want you to do. And to be fair, they had a really good point, and um, it's stuck with us. So it's just traditional classic method is what was what we stick with. I think. Well, I remember Bloomsbury. Tell me if I'm wrong, but it used to be a vintage brand, didn't it, for a long time? So um, yeah, so all our wines are vintage wines, and the reason they stayed that way for so long is it took us such a long time to really build up any volume of commercial reserve. Um, I mean, it was always our intention for a long time to, to have a non-vintage, um, just because you do get, you know, we've, you know, we're growing grapes right on the cusp where you can commercially. So you, you do get lean years, you do get light years, and that having that reserve as a backup, A would help with volume, but B would help with consistency, which is what a non-vintage is meant to do. Um, and I think actually, when we finally did make the leap, it's actually improved the Bloomsbury greatly. Um, I'm really happy with the decision to go on vintage. It seems a completely different wine now. Uh, was it your uh, relationship with Tinwood in that lovely, curiously flat, but chalk bed vineyard <clears throat> near Chichester that, that helped this decision? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, there's always been a really close relationship with Tinwood. Um, and then when Art decided to start significantly expanding as we did with other growers as well. It just meant that we started to have volumes that allowed us to do or achieve things that we wanted to, which, you know, for years and years, which is a nice position to be in, but we constantly struggled to keep up with demand. Um, 
you know, we are actively not taking on any new customers for many years. We're just trying to keep supplying who we had. So it's really only the last sort of four or five years that we've actually really had to sell anyone for, um, which is a nice position to be in. But, um, but in doing that, it just meant, you know, we were, we were, we're going through and have been for the last sort of five, six years, going through a massive expansion plans. Um, and that takes us from five years ago, we're at 150,000 bottles to hopefully by 2024, we'll be up to around six to 700,000 bottles. And uh, where, where, do you, where do you go after that, Simon? What's the, um, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a fair few bottles to start selling. <laughs> Well, at the moment, as a family, we thought that's, it's always been quite important to us to stay below a million bottle winery. Um, as a family, we really like the fact that we're very much involved in every aspect of the business. Um, and I think once you get to a business that size, you're no longer a small family business. Um, so while we're still really enjoying what we're doing, that's, it's, it's a conscious decision that we'll try and stick below that. But then we said that, so we wouldn't go above 50,000 bottles and we wouldn't go above 100,000 bottles. So who knows? It's nice. It's nice. Would... That must be nice to have that option. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You as you as the winemaker, I mean, how much time are you split between making wine and in the office worrying about paying for things? Uh, well, that's been one of the good positives about this year, actually, is that there's my, I've had a hundred percent focus in the winery since March. Um, so we're joking, this has been our most efficient bottling season ever. Despite being our largest bottling, we actually finished a month ahead of schedule and with just the five of us rather than bringing in external help. So this year I've spent much more than normal, but it's, you know what it's like, there's always different things going on. You know, we all belong to different wine GB groups and different focus groups and there's always things to sell and those tough trips over to the States or to Scandinavia, that things like that. So, so all of that stopped this year, but otherwise generally it's, I try and try and have the balance in the winery side if I can, but each year it gets a bit more harder. Uh, and so Export is the, um, I know it's an, an important area for you and it was for Mike, partly because I launched your 2008 Ridgeview in Paris at Fauchon. Um, uh, for some reason, there I was standing in Paris, in fact, surrounded by these extremely elegant French people, showing them your 2008. Uh, and they liked it. There was, a, a, there was a, a complete public transport strike in Paris, as there normally is, as far as I can make out at the time. I then remember that in 2014, you proudly told me that you started exporting to Uganda which I thought, great, I think I bet they'd be absolutely delighted a, 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 a few glasses of that on the side of the lake in the evening. And then I remember you telling me um, that you'd started, things were working very well in America and you were trying to get a group of you to bring sommeliers and writers from America to England. Um, so it seems to me that export is something that really matters to you. Uh, can you can you give us a, a, a look into the future on that? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, you know, we're, st we're still a very small industry within a big industry in the UK, but there's a lot of wine, new wineries coming on board, it's considerable size. Um, so it's always been quite a big focus to us. So we've always got up really good relationships with our distributors abroad. So they become part of our Ridgeview family. Um, and, you know, I think it's, I think English sparkling wine has a good story behind it, which people tend to like. And at the moment we're small enough that generally the people that are being sent out are the people that are making the wines or, you know, they're very much involved in the business rather than just salespeople. Um, and especially in the States, I mean, it's such a big market and you really do need to spend a lot of time in market to make it work, um, which, you know, we're all really happy to do. Um, so that's been a real focus. Scandinavia is really strong for us. I think for many reasons, I think our wines really suit the cuisine. Um, the standard of living in Scandinavia is quite high. So our wines actually seem really good value. I think is quite a good selling point. Um, 
and Asia is proving to be really good actually. Um, Singapore's really strong. Um, Taiwan's proving to be surprisingly a really good market actually. In fact, we've got a Zoom tasting on Tuesday with our distributors. Um, yeah, so it's, yeah. And the thing is, as a, we all like traveling. So, you know, having a sales trip to go and travel with is an extra bonus. So I mean, if you can't do that, you're the winemaker. <laughs> Um, the this take brings us back to the, the the whole idea of of brand now is english sparkling wine a brand in itself and a good enough brand um is the responsibility for branding up to people like your, yourself and night timber and and hattingley and all the others say we're the brand but the overall thing is english sparkling wine um is merit as a brand, something which you're going to continue with. And of course, when we get right down to the end of the question, what do you think about the Sussex PDO? And is it something which is relevant to you? Um, that's a lot of questions. Um, um, firstly, firstly, just in order, I, Simon, if you can remember them as well. Yeah. <laughs> so firstly, I mean, I think as a collaborative, you know, like our first trip to Provine, as English wine producers, you know, that year, I mean, Provine's got a massive buzz anyway, but I think that year we were definitely, as the English wine producers stand, that was the buzz of the whole show. Yeah. And I think it's continued with that because, you know, you've got a stand where you've got six, seven, eight international quality sparkling wines. And as a brand, as English wines, it is really strong. And I think, as an export, as a brand, you know, it's much easier to take a, a wine on your wine list as a category. You know, otherwise it's just a one-off niche. It's a bit of a novelty. If you create a crack category of English wine, then there's something of interest, there's something to look at. And um, no, we're definitely, I think we're definitely stronger together. And I mean, a lot of us, um, we kind of all got into the industry at the same time. We all went to college together. So we've, literally you know we all started this as young adults and we've grown up together so we very much work as a collective anyway you know like i'll speak to emma or charlie or just, you know if we need some help with something or we've run out of something or oh can you do this have you got this we can borrow you know we do that all the time and i think that follows through with the business side of it as well so definitely really strong um merit is still a bit of a contentious issue. I mean, it's still something that is important to interview. We still have, in honor of the fact that Christopher Merritt was from London, we still have our signature range, which is Bloomsbury, Cavendish, Fitzrovia. Um, as a generic name for English sparkling wine, I think that's another question, really. Um, you know, we've got the classic method mark coming out online. Um, so I don't know. I mean, it's. I, I, I wonder if that debate's moved on now. Um, I don't I know. I, I, I feel perhaps I'm too close to the industry, but I often feel that I think just the name English <laughs> is what it is. I mean, the Englishness I think is a is a great selling point. I think whatever your one's views on Brexit, you know, I I think that that will actually work out well for England and for for English wine. Um, I, I don't think we, we necessarily need a name or a catch-all, but um, that's just my view. No, I, I agree with you, Kieran. I, and and it, it even puts up into the discussion, do we actually need British? I mean, I, I'm very friendly with the Welsh guys, um, uh, and I think they're doing a fantastic job in very different circumstances down there. Um, but... Uh, is the word British better or worse than the word English? I don't know. Well, I mean, British what, wine is a completely thing. different product, isn't it? I mean, British wine technically is juice from wherever Europe that's imported into the UK and then made into wine. So British wine could be an Argentinian Cabernet Sauvignon, oh. um, but it's made and bottled in England. So the whole emphasis on English or English and Welsh is super important and it's super important to educate mm. the consumer what the difference is in the same respect that there's a massive difference between 
classic method and Charmat or carbonated. Um, you know, and it's our job as producers of whatever you want to call it, classic, classic method, English quality sparkling wine. It's up to us to educate the consumer what the difference is and why the difference is. Um, and that's something that's really important to Ridgeview. You know, it's something that we focus on. So, Are you Simon, going to Charmat at all or not? No. Sorry, I was missed that. I just, I was just saying to Simon, and he gave me the most succinct of all his replies. Are you going to move into Charmat at all? And Simon's reply, repeat it, Simon. It was so beautifully done. No. <laughs> Simon, I, I really enjoyed the wines. Um, I, I really enjoyed the freshness, uh, the clarity. Uh, I, I, I thought they were extremely approachable, yet were serious. Um, in, uh, be, be, you raised an interesting point about, about secondary fermentation. What, what I didn't necessarily get was bags of autolysis. Um, do you, it, and that might be me, it might be the day, but is, is that something, do you, do you think, is that down to, and answer the question really is about, is about your winemaking and, you know, what do you set out to achieve in the fit? And what we, what we're tasted today, is that what you set out to achieve at the start of the project or, or are you looking to create more autolysis? Are you looking, I don't know if these wines have been through a malolactic fermentation, for instance, are you, are you looking for creaminess? Are you not? Are you looking for fruit? Are you not? What, what's, what's your view on balance and uh, acidity? Um, and so I don't know whether it's <clears throat> from a passion that, you know, we, I started very much uh, in the vineyards. That was really all I was going to do is just look after the vines. So whether that's had an influence, but for me, and I certainly feel, obviously I don't want to speak for dad, but I felt that he felt the same, is that the grapes are the most important thing in the wine. And therefore that needs to be the hero of every wine that we make. So for us, the balance is the fact for me, balance normally implies if you if, if a wine is anything too much, it's too sweet, it's too fruity, it's too acidic, then it's not balanced. However, say, having said that, what we do want to be out of balance is the intensity of the fruit. We always want that to be at the forefront of the palate. It's the first thing we want people to notice. Um, if you read any of our tasting notes, the first thing we talk about is what fruit is on the palate. Um, and for me, that's a very much conscious decision from, from day one, from, from bud burst in the vineyard to when we disgorge that wine. It's every, every process we do is to make sure that we keep the intensity of the fruit. Um, with regards to mallow, ideally, we would, we've always, obviously you measure sugar leading up to harvest, you know, but for us, it's literally, all it is, the sugar reading is just an indication of ripeness. All we, all we concentrate on is the acidity. So we will pick on acidity for the simple fact so that we can get that window where we've got optimum ripeness. So we've got all that fruit coming in, but we've got enough acidity that we can deal 100% mallow. Um, so the last three years has been really interesting. Well, we haven't had that option. So we very much... Um, have done partial mallows or you know there'll be you know maybe 20 50 percent that we won't put through mallow this year especially is normally would have nearly all be done by mallow um you know by the end of november beginning of december we literally only just started last week because we have we're going through tank by tank basis looking at what the final blends will be what that ta on the final blend will be and then deciding whether to put the blend through mallow rather than the tanks through mellow. So, so from a winemaking point of view, that's been really interesting, um, looking at different ways we're going to manage that acidity. Um, so, yeah, normally we like that creaminess, but we want our wines to be very fruitful, very fresh. So the autolysis is there. I mean, even our limited edition wines are not relatively long lees age, you know? They're a minimum of three years old. For that reason is that we want the autolysis to be in harmony with the wine, but not the main component. Mm. No, what no, about, no. You about do you, I know you've got this wonderful new oak cuvee. Mm -hmm. um, what about oak in general? Do you use oak at all in your, in your normal winemaking? Nearly every wine that we make will have some oak in it, but in our, you know, so our three signature wines and 
the limiteds that we do mostly, hopefully you would never taste that oak. It will be there as a complexity. Um, so it's always, we've always made a decision that we always buy, you know, minimum three year old, generally white burgundy barrels. Um, and if we ferment in the barrels, then we'll take that out after a couple of months and put something else in. So the oak reserve from a rigid point of view was a very much a very, very different style of winemaking. Um, but hopefully still stayed within within the Ridgeview family. What, it was. What's the oak your baby or somebody else's? Um, well, I'll tell you how the oak came around. So I don't know if you, if you remember when Polaris first came out, Cloudy Bay's sparkling wine, when Harry Osborne was the winemaker. Yes. And back then I was very much, you know, I just started making wine. I was still really young. Didn't really know much about wine. Certainly didn't really drink it if I was going out. And then dad introduced me to this wine and I was like, oh my God, that is amazing. That's really the first one I really passionately fell in love with. And then in 2008, uh, I was allowed, not allowed, that we had some wine that I was allowed to muck around with. So I made a, not, a, not a heavily oak influenced wine, but it certainly was made with oak. Um, Dad didn't really like it particularly, but luckily uh, Sue Daniels, for Marks and Spencer's quite liked it. So that's what went on to become Marksman. Uh -huh. um, but to be fair, Sue would come down each year for blending and slowly the oak would get more and more cut back. Um, so really when the opportunity, when we do the Coopers, the French Coopers were looking for a way into the UK. So they were um, looking, talking to different English wineries saying, would you be interested in some barrels? So we said, yeah, for sure. So it was the very first time we'd ever had new oak in the winery, um, it's hilarious. So the lorry arrived, the whole winery emptied out as the barrels came off the lorry. Um, everyone was started hugging and stroking the barrels. Everyone was so excited. So that is where the oak, what went on to become the oak preserve started. I mean, that really was, it started with us just having a play around in different, different toasts in new oak. And then we thought, actually, let's, um, let's do something with this. And that's how it developed really. And what about dosage? Uh, what are your feelings about uh, dosage, taking it low or leaving it high? Um, I mean, there's definitely a trend now for people, well, certainly for winemakers to prefer low dosage. Um, and I think there is a bit of buzz within the consumer, but personally for me, um, it's, it's not about that. It's about the balance of the wine. So, you know, the wine, you know, we've had a couple of wines come out recently where comparatively for Ridgeview, they're quite low. Um, but then, you know, I've got absolutely no qualms. If the wine is balanced at 10 grams, then we'll dose it at 10 grams. You know, it's not. Do, do you see, do you, I mean, obviously Oz is heavily involved with the world of wine judging, but do you, do you see that reflected in wine judging that um, judges often like something with less dosage, and you know that your wine will sell better with more dosage or, you know, maybe, maybe balance plus. Um, I mean, we enter lots of competitions, you know, because it's always nice to be judged by your peers, um, the supermarkets like the gold medals on the bottles. So it's, it's always important to us, but we would never, we would never make a wine or we would never dose a wine with a competition in mind. Um, yeah. And sometimes, you know, you get feedback saying, oh, I think that was, you know, dosed a bit high, but, you know, you know that your direct consumer, they like it like that. So, and we learned a long time ago, whereas both dad and I, in fact, as a family, we like really dry sparkling wines. Mm. And even now, if I like it, if I like it, I'll add a gram on because I know that's too dry for most of the consumers, you know, so it's, and at the end of the day, that's who we're making it for. It's making it for the consumer, mm -hmm. you know. So it's it's very, an added bonus, I think. It's very reassuring to hear that, Simon, because I completely agree. I obviously judge a lot. Um, and in this last decade, uh, it's been evident that the judging, um, not the standards, which are probably as high as ever or higher, but the sort of templates are going like this all the time. 
And I think that even a year and a half ago, uh, Kieran's uh, suggestion that the, the low dosage would get better marks was true. And this year, I don't think it's nearly so true anymore. Um, Interesting. Because what you're saying, of course, is eventually balance, balance, balance. And I, I'm, I'm a great, I, I like, if, if I can generalize, that sort of sweet spot, six, seven, eight, nine grams of sugar seems to me to work far more often than it doesn't work. I agree. So we, when we, um, so our scorching line, um, when we were getting trained up, um, so it's made by a small TDD, which is a small family business in, in FNA. And I was talking to Stan, who is the most amazing character. He's the, the owner, the designer, the engineer. He does the whole batch shebang. And I was talking to him and I said, so, you know, how do we do this when we adjust the dosage? And he looked at me and goes, will you just set it? I said, yeah. But then obviously we'll do another wine and then we'll do this wine. That will be at this grams. This will be at this gram. He goes, no, 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 no. You just set it and then that's it. So that, you know, but that was how they saw it. They said, you just have a standard, whatever it is, nine grams per litre, and that's what you dose everything at. So it's, I think it's a, I think it's a very English thing or very, or maybe, maybe new world that every single wine, the dosage gets adjusted all the time. You know, we're looking at that intricacy. So it's, I do think it's quite uniquely new world actually. Okay, Simon, it's uh, been absolutely fascinating. What I love about your plans for X1, I love the idea of English wines getting out there throughout the world. Uh, I, I wish you the very, very best of luck with, uh, with all of your export plans. And thank you so much for joining us. And let's all hope that we remain forever thirsty. Lovely, thank you. Forever thirsty. Hi, it's Charlie the Wine. Now, if you've enjoyed this video and would like to learn a little bit more about the services that me, Charlie the Wine, can offer, why not head over to my website, www.foreverthirsty.co.uk, and just see all the wonderful offerings I can help with. But please remain forever thirsty.